One of the more interesting uh, theories that Albert Einstein proposed during his life was proven about half a decade ago. Quite simply, time travels faster at higher elevations and that can be very welcome news for us. It has to do with the force of gravity and one of the ways by which scientists proved the theory was using super sensitive atomic clocks on the ground and compared the passage of time there on the surface of the earth at sea level with that in an airplane at 30,000 feet. And sure enough, time passed quicker in the airplane. A second took less time up there than down here. And the reason for that is very good news for all of us because at the moment we are sitting at 3,000 feet in elevation while in Eureka they're at 2,600 feet. And all this is to say that my sermon is going to go a lot faster than Patty Ann's this morning as she preaches to the good people at St. Michael's and All Angels and as a result we're going to get to coffee hour before they do up there. That is a plus that I think is worth putting on the website. <coughs> For those of us without the gift of patience, such as myself, the slow passage of time can be extremely trying. And we will jump at anything to minimize the pain of waiting, sit through the three lights in the turn lane at Costco on the northbound Highway 93, and you know exactly what I mean. Sadly, however, the other fact about Einstein's discovery is that the difference in time, in where we live and move and have our being, to quote that phrase from the Acts of the Apostles, and places that are lower or higher is only about a handful of a hundred millionths of a second over our lifetime. So even while true, it's really not the good news for which we might have hoped and we're back to being called to be patient with the passage of time as it is. I'm guessing that many, if not the vast majority of us, are not patient. Were we, the author of the second lesson would probably not have chosen to write what he did this morning. But undoubtedly with people impatient all around him, with good reason, it seemed like the topic for the day. And so they were told to wait for the coming of the Lord, not unlike a farmer waits for the crops to appear from the earth. And that becomes especially meaningful to us today with a foot of snow sitting on the ground. A little context with respect to this second reading that we heard might be useful here. It is most certainly, if not assuredly the case, that this particular letter was not in fact written by James, the brother, or as some believe, the cousin of our Lord. People who understand Greek a whole lot better than I do look at the style and the nature of the actual reading, including its idioms. And from that, these experts place the authorship of this letter right around the end of the first century. And so when the contemporaries of our Lord had written many, many, many years earlier, that he would appear again during their lifetimes, the window of opportunity for his delivering them was closing pretty quickly. Meanwhile, Jerusalem had fallen. The temple had been destroyed. And while there had not been severe wide press, per, uh, widespread persecution at the time, several notables, including Stephen and Paul and Peter and all of the disciples, with the exception of John, had lost their lives for the faith. So with Christianity out of favor with the rulers of the world, leaders of the Jesus movement being martyred and things generally getting hotter as the days were rolling on, the young church was hoping that in very short order, Jesus would appear again and free them from their anxiety. Waiting around was just not a happy option for these first century Christians. Being content to hold back seemed really to be setting people up to live in increasing peril. So you can easily understand from where all that impatience was coming from. They had been promised deliverance and it had not yet arrived. 
in considering things that are a lot more serious than waiting to turn into Costco. We are not a whole lot different in hoping most earnestly for rescue for ourselves and most certainly for others. How long have we been following the news out of Aleppo and Syria and bemoaning the awfulness of it all? How long have Cuban Americans waited for the end of the Castro regime? Fidel, after all, outlived nearly the entirety of the tenure of 11 presidents, a quarter of those who have served in that office throughout our history. For those of you my age, 61, that's the same number of presidents that have been around since you've been alive. And now his brother expects to stay around for another two years. They have to wait even longer. Closer to home, the Little Shell Indians, with whom I went to elementary school in Great Falls, have been waiting a century and a half for just simple recognition from the federal government that they exist saying, be patient, feels not very helpful to those folks under that kind of stress. Crying out for deliverance is a natural response, and it really is understandable. But it doesn't seem to be coming in our timeline the way we want it. With respect to what we heard in the letter of James, we have at least a couple things to consider, I think. And the first is the obvious. There's reason to be patient because some things just take time to develop. Several years ago, and this is of course an example that's very familiar to every single one of us. When folks up the canyon, as we say, in the towns of Coram and Hungry Horse lost their school, the esprit de corps of that community took one severe kick in the teeth. So much of the identity of the community was simply taken away. You ripped the school out from underneath them, you've ripped out their heart. And if you've ever wondered about that, just think of the pride and excitement that Whitefish, Columbia Falls, and Kalispell high schools bring to our neck of the woods. Imagine not being able to go to the elementary school or the middle school in your neighborhood and hear the winter concerts delivered by your kids. And so as a result, the Lutherans, the Methodists, and the Episcopalians set out to establish a community mill. And the first year, maybe 20-something show up, a few more than that. The next year it grew, and this last year, now over 120 have been attending. And it's more than just a great meal, it's an occasion really to help folks connect with one another, to once again be in community. Well, it took a year and a half, nearly two years, for that thing to really get going. But we are compelled by the gospel to stick to it and to allow God to work in ways that we may not immediately appreciate or understand. And for a second great familiar example, the first year that we had our famed Chile Open, we had around 30 golfers schlepping around in the snow and we raised about 300 clams and we felt pretty good about that. Last year, the ninth year, we had around 72 golfers in the snow and we raised well over $5,000 for vulnerable pets in the valley and on the reservation. Turns out things do take time and to work within time patience is really really helpful it allows you to stick with it second thing also has to be said being patient does not mean doing nothing being patient can also mean actively waiting in great expectation spiritually you and i can use this season to prepare for a reinvigorated appreciation of christmas that's what it's there for. But a third thing is equally important, and in my mind, maybe most important. When those in great need, because they are oppressed, captive, hungry, and without hope, are asked to be patient, others who are called and enabled to do the work of Advent, that being heralded in the gospel and the kingdom, can become the very proof that waiting for deliverance need never be futile. In other words, during Advent, you and I can be the hope 
that others see in the distance making its way towards them. When the author of this morning's reading wrote, be patient, establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand, what he is saying is that deliverance is on the way. And guess who's bringing it? It's the body of Christ. And that happens to be who we are. This afternoon, immediately after church, I'm heading up the canyon to deliver a check that will take care of someone's rent so that they're not evicted at this particular time. I'm doing that in your name. And you think about it. Tomorrow is 11 degrees below zero. And tomorrow, instead of the desperate need awaiting them, there'll be a warmth that will absolutely enfold him because of the generosity of this place. If you need more proof than that, just look in front of you here. There's about 400 pounds now of dog and cat food waiting to be distributed to people who cannot afford it at the moment to feed their hungry pets. Now, while working to get back on their feet, of course, they're called by the epistle to be patient. And yet at the same time, we are called to give them certainty and hope so that their patience is never in vain. And imagine the effect of knowing that in God's time, God's deliverance can come into your life. Two weeks ago at Super One, I was invited to act five bucks to our food bill uh, to benefit the local food bank, which I did when we checked out. And the clerk thanked me, and then probably because I was wearing my clerical collar, asked me about our church and what we were about. And I told her about the fact that we've not only collected food for the food bank this last week, but we also were doing uh, dog and cat food this week. And she was pretty excited over that whole thing. And then she said in a very hushed voice, that last year, as a single mom and unemployed, when things were really tough, she herself had to go to the food bank several times. And so this year, she never passes up a chance to donate to it. Now that she's in fairly good shape, but even more importantly, understanding herself as someone who is absolutely empowered to make a difference in the life of the world. We are called to give hope. And hope shall never disappoint us, says St. Paul. So today, Einstein notwithstanding, let us be patient. And give the Holy Spirit the time to fill us and renew us. And let us continue also to be the folks for whom people have been waiting, maybe all their lives. And when we hear others cry the words of Charles Wesley's Advent hymn, Come, thou long-expected Jesus, may we joyfully say, we're on our way. See you in just a bit. Amen. <laughs>